Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast, where we talk about all things true crime, with a special emphasis on the most riveting cases of the moment. I'm your host, T, and I hope you're all having a great day. Please do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe if you're not yet subscribed, With that out of the way, let's get started. A lot of people have been mentioning the location of a certain drug and rehabilitation facility in Clarksville, Georgia, and its proximity to the spot where Debbie Collier was found. The rehab center is called Victory Home, and it's located at 157 Victory Lane. Now, if you look at a map, you can see that sure enough, the spot where Debbie Collier was found is off US Highway 441 slash Georgia 15, just south of Victory Home Lane. Debbie's body was located about two tenths of a mile into the woods beyond an old logging road entrance. I read that the crime scene was about a 15-minute walk into the woods. Whoever coaxed or forced Debbie into parking her rental vehicle there likely knew about the area and that old logging road in advance of the crime. Victory Home describes itself as a faith-based drug and alcohol rehabilitation program that has been serving men with addictions since 1959. So this rehab is strictly for men. If the perpetrator knew about the old logging road area because of doing a stint in the Victory Home Rehab, then that person had to be a male. Of course, it's also possible that a female visited a male in the rehab center and that female knew about the old logging road and the dense woods beyond it because of those visits. Some have theorized that perhaps Debbie was up in Clarksville and Tallulah Falls that Saturday because she was trying to get a male in her life into the Victory Home Rehab Center. This is because of Victory Home's proximity to the crime scene and the fact that some people have analyzed the disturbing message sent from Steve Collier's Venmo account to Debbie's daughter, Amanda Bearden, along with the $2,385, and thought that perhaps the bit where Debbie allegedly wrote, they are not going to let me go, means that Debbie was maybe trying to get into the rehab center to check it out or someone in her life who needed rehab and they, meaning Victory Home, are not going to let her go and check it out. I'm not really buying into this theory, but to see if it has any legs, I contacted Victory Home to inquire about whether Debbie Collier had an appointment on Saturday, September 10th to visit the rehab, which was open that day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. I also wanted to ask them if Debbie Collier attempted to visit the rehab and was denied access. I'm waiting for a reply. I would love to also ask Victory Home if Amanda's boyfriend, Andrew Geigerich, did a stint at Victory Home, but I believe the record of someone being in rehab would fall under the HIPAA rules the privacy rules. If so, which I'm pretty sure it does, Victory Home will not share that information with me. They would probably have to disclose it to the police, though. It sure would be interesting to see if anyone associated with Debbie Collier ever spent time at Victory Home. Maybe Andrew Geigerich, who's been trawling my comments section, can let us all know if he was ever in rehab at that Victory Home in Clarksville. Andrew did write in a comment on my channel that he has never done any illicit substances. He just said drugs. 
and he is an amateur MMA fighter, so it would not surprise me if he was telling the truth about that. I mean, athletes generally don't take stuff like heroin, meth, cocaine, and the like, but there are always exceptions. There are probably many athletes who get hooked on drugs. But what about anabolic steroids, or roids, as they're commonly called? Athletes have definitely been known to use these to boost their athletic performance and build up their muscle tissue and body mass. I bet an amateur MMA fighter who's on the smaller side in terms of his build might be willing to do some roids to get a competitive edge and grow bigger muscles, all the better for landing harder punches. The problem with roids is that they can damage the body in the long run and they can promote aggressiveness in the person taking them. There's even a name for this, roid rage. Roid rage is described as an outburst of anger, aggression, or violence attributed to the use of anabolic steroids. Of course, we have no evidence of Andrew Geigerich taking anabolic steroids or any other illicit substances, and we don't even know if he's involved in what happened to Debbie Collier. So this is all pure speculation, which is what we do in true crime. Andrew Geigerich was once arrested for driving under the influence, but he took a plea deal and the charge was dropped to reckless driving. Does this hint at Andrew having a possible problem with alcohol? Getting caught driving under the influence definitely points to a problem, at least on that one occasion. But is it an ongoing problem? We don't yet know. The Victory Home website says it operates on donations and gifts, and for someone to take a six-month rehab program, it costs $475 a month. That gets you room and board, meals, and whatever therapy and classes a person will get. $475 times six for six months comes to $2,850, another amount that's somewhat comparable to the $2,385 that Debbie allegedly transferred to her daughter, Amanda, via Venmo. I say allegedly because we don't know who actually made that transaction happen, but it's not the exact amount, right? Could someone have asked Debbie for the money to get a loved one into Victory Home? Or could someone have forced Debbie to give them the money for the rehab? Yes, but wouldn't that person then ask for the full fees of $2,850? I cannot say for certain if Victory Home Rehab Center plays any role in this crime. It may turn out that someone close to the family did spend time at Victory Home or was planning to spend time there. I'm hoping we can find out for certain one way or another. If anyone has information about a possible connection between Debbie Collier and Victory Home Rehab, please let the Habersham Sheriff's Office know about that right away. And after you do that, please feel free to contact me at my email, which is on my About page. I'm a writer and journalist, and as such, I keep my sources completely confidential. What other reasons might Debbie Collier have had to journey 70 miles from home to that family dollar store in Clayton, Georgia? A very clever person wrote a comment yesterday saying that perhaps Debbie was lured all that way to Clayton because someone had a dead car battery or another car problem. I thought that was quite plausible. If so, who was that person? 
We've heard from Andrew Geigerich that he and Amanda Bearden were in Athens, Georgia all day Saturday, and he said their cell phones will prove it. To that I say, he and Amanda could have left their phones on, left them in Athens, and then headed out of town. I'm not saying they're involved, but I'm saying that just because their cell phones may show they were at one location in Athens, Georgia all day, doesn't necessarily mean that they were there in person with their phones. Did someone else have car trouble? We don't know. What else could have lured Debbie Collier to Clayton? Well, some people have theorized that because Debbie's daughter, Amanda Bearden, worked for Habitat for Humanity in Maryland, that perhaps she got a job at the Habitat for Humanity location in Clayton, Georgia. Yes, there's a Habitat for Humanity in Clayton, and there's also one in Clarksville, Georgia, the area near where Debbie Collier was found. So is there a connection between Amanda Bearden's work for Habitat for Humanity and those spots 70 miles away from Athens that Debbie Collier visited on Saturday. I called the Habitat for Humanity location in Clayton, Georgia, and they told me unequivocally that Amanda Bearden does not work there. I also called the location in Clarksville. The office manager did not pick up so I left a message asking if Amanda Bearden works for them, and I'm hoping to hear back soon. The police have said that the crime was personal and targeted. That tells me that someone close to Debbie lured her those 70 miles from home. But who? Debbie's cell phone was found smashed at the crime scene. I'm hoping that this case can be figured out through phone records, emails, text messages, etc. But did the predator ask Debbie in person to drive to Clayton so that there's no record of the conversation? That's a good possibility. But wouldn't Debbie have told her husband Steve that she was going to be driving those 70 miles to Clayton on Saturday? It doesn't sound like he knew about the road trip from what he tells the detective when reporting Debbie missing on the 911 call. He never mentions Debbie going on this journey. So if Debbie didn't tell Steve about the drive, why not? Was it because Debbie was forced into this 70-mile drive by whoever did her in, and her cell phone was confiscated by the perpetrator at the start of the trip? Preventing Debbie from calling Steve or dialing 911? Those are definite possibilities, but they're not the only possibilities. Maybe Debbie deliberately kept the trip to Clayton a secret. Maybe Debbie was doing something for her troubled daughter Amanda, and maybe she didn't want Steve to know about it. Perhaps Steve Collier had had enough of Amanda and her requests for cash so that Debbie would not have wanted to tell him that she was going to Clayton to do something for Amanda. That's a possibility. Sometimes wives keep secrets from their husbands to keep the peace. Another theory people have come up with is that Debbie Collier was up in Clayton and Clarksville to meet up with another man. They base this on a lady who has a YouTube channel and who is related to Debbie Collier's first husband, the man with whom Debbie had her two children, Amanda and Jeffrey Bearden. I refer to Amanda and Jeff's dad as Mr. Bearden, while the father of this lady on YouTube was Mr. Bearden's brother. So Mr. Bearden is the lady on YouTube's uncle. So this lady on YouTube brought up alleged cheating, which has led people to speculate that perhaps Debbie Collier was cheating on her current husband, Steve Collier. We web sleuths don't currently have access to any evidence that shows that. 
and people who know Steve Collier say that he loved Debbie with all his heart and he would never harm her. Also, Debbie's colleagues at the Carriage House Realty in Athens say that she never mentioned any marital problems to them, but maybe Debbie was good at keeping secrets and the type of person who keeps conversations at work away from her personal life. Some people do that to protect themselves. Some of Debbie and Steve Collier's neighbors have said that the couple mostly kept to themselves, that they weren't outside all the time and making a point to get to know their neighbors. That points to Debbie and Steve Collier maybe being a tad insular with their private life. Maybe they were also embarrassed because of those alleged screaming incidents at their home. The screaming and yelling that the neighbors claimed they heard repeatedly on weekends when a young woman would come to visit. When I was growing up, my house was the one in the small neighborhood where we lived from which all the yelling came. When my dad started yelling at my brother, and my brother started yelling back at him, which was a regular occurrence for years at our house, it was loud. My mom and I would try to shush them to no avail. And if it was in the summer, I would run around closing all the windows, hoping I could keep the argument from being heard outside. I was always mortified by those screaming matches. Clearly, my dad didn't care who heard him, and my brother didn't care either. I, on the other hand, was beyond embarrassed. But I digress. If only we knew what prompted Debbie Collier to make that 70-mile journey from home. What do you guys think? Why was Debbie so far from home and dressed as if she'd be attending the Georgia Bulldogs home game in Athens, where she lived. It doesn't make any sense. Please help me make it make sense. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories, now do me a favor, smash that like button.